And welcome to another edition of NYABJ Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate, and NYABJ Media Co-Chair. And with me is... I'm Bob Anthony, NYABJ Media Watch Co-Chair. And welcome to another edition of Media Watch, uh, the show that's brought to you by EVT Educational Productions in association with the New York Association of Black Journalists. And we take a look at what's been covered well, ill, so-so by pretty much most media, primarily mainstream media, because nine times out of ten, they really need a report card. <laughs> But, but and, that's we our <laughs> and we try to give them one. <laughs> we try that's, to give them one. That's for sure. And we try to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> but we do call it as we see it and read it and see the tweets and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, um, by the time this airs on, I think, Monday the 18th, yeah, I'll right, to that Monday effect. the 18th. Yeah. Um, there will still be a series of stories percolating in the ether. Uh, so probably still uppermost will be what's going on as a result of the typhoon that hit the Philippines. So I know from your serious way of trying to find out what's going on overseas using all the media, um, your take on the initial coverage was what? Good, bad, indifferent, or <laughs> too much speculation? Uh, you hit it with that last one, too much speculation. Uh, there was a uh, a lot of people trying to get the reports out quickly and very little information coming in. And we had numbers thrown around about de uh, extremely high death tolls. We knew where the storm would hit. The track of the storm was not an issue. We knew exactly where the storm would hit and what towns would be affected. But uh, the good information as to who, uh, how badly they were affected when wasn't coming out. Yeah, what I, I noticed that the weather people were tracking the storm quite well because they were again impressed with the size <laughs> right. of the way it was showing up from the satellite photos and, and their radar pictures. So as you said, that storm track was extremely well documented. What struck me was after the storm hit and everything went totally bananas, then all of a sudden we started getting all kinds of, oh, we only know only four dead right now, but we know we expect that total to rise. And then like within hours, it was something like 10,000 expected dead in the Philippines. I went, what? 10,000? Right. <laughs> How'd we go from four to 10,000 in the less than 24 hours? <laughs> the number seemed, the, the, the number came out of the ether. I mean, it, it just seemed to jump out there. And uh, you and I were, were talking earlier uh, today about what I was trying to do to get the information just on my own as an independent journalist. And I was uh, explaining that you could have gotten a lot of information just by what wasn't coming in. Because usually when we had Hurricane Sandy, uh, well, Superstorm Sandy, we had tweets, we had Facebook posts, we had emails, we had cell phone calls. We had all sorts of information coming in. There was a lot of social media stuff coming. Right. And because uh, even though they were badly hit, the communications infrastructure was up. It was still up. That's right. So I went on the Internet when I knew the storm would be hitting, and I just tried to pull in Internet radio stations in the Philippines, and some of them were running, and some of them were out. And I noticed that every film clip I saw on TV was the same one. Same one. That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> and so that told me that, They're come on. They're getting stuff from one place, one right. location, one source. Right. Because every station was using that, that same clip. That clip. same clip. <laughs> and you right. know, And you know in the Philippines, everybody <laughs> has, a, has a smartphone, they do. Uh, cameras, etc. And, et and, and, and they normally have decent working television stations. <laughs> right. <laughs> and a lot of good freelance cameramen. Right. So. It, that, that, <laughs> that was my point. Mm -hmm. And who know how to get information out right. in a bad situation That's and right. none of that com was coming out yeah. so even with a lack of information you could pinpoint where the information wasn't coming from and that told you my god we have a bad situation yeah if all of the yeah. communications are down this is yeah. bad we had no count but you right. could have drawn on the map the 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 blank area I, I was really interested based on because I was intuiting exactly what you were saying about the same video lack of communication how in the world were they getting an assessment like 10,000 mm -hmm. if they were not getting any grassroots feedback on how devastated certain areas were? And 
Philippines is not that connected, even when a typhoon does. You got these yep. gazillion islands, mm -hmm. few main ones, but there are a lot of islands, and they're always subject to typhoons. So you know with a storm like that, communication is going to be down. So I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head going, where is this 10,000 figure coming from? It could be that bad. It might even be worse. But right. how can you just come up with a big round figure of 10,000 people dead? I mean, and one, so. of, one of the things I heard on the radio station, one of the stations before that it went out, it had reported that the president had instructed all local elected officials to stay in their jurisdictions if they could. Just so, so that there would be a governmental yeah, presence in every location within reason. No, I could and, understand and, that. And so that I think had some order. Right. And, and some, some infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Right. But yet none of that was reporting. And that, mm -hmm. again, after the storm hit, and that told me again, oh, yeah. we have a pretty bad Big, situation. Yeah, yeah. communication is definitely, definitely down. So by the time this airs on Monday, I'm guessing what's being estimated uh, are almost officially confirmed of 2,300 right. deaths so far. In that neighborhood. In yes. that neighborhood. They, they're not, cause they haven't really had an actual count, but I, I right. suspect that they're close to the correct figure with that. By the weekend and with more communications established, I definitely expect that number to rise. But I'm um, keeping my fingers crossed it's not going to jump to 10,000. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do too. And uh, the, the, the terrible thing is uh, I think I read that 30 cities had yet to be reached. Wow. So it's a serious yeah, issue yeah, as to whether yeah. they got out, and which hey, they could have. They, they had all sorts yeah, of warning. Yeah, they, but then I, again. And, and they're used to getting hit. Right. And so there's a good That's possibility. Another. But but with 30 cities unheard from, you know there may be some seriously larger numbers right. coming in. So my prayers so, to the folks yeah. we haven't heard of. Yeah, yet. and 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 folks, you know, there are on any number of, you know, save the kids, save the children, UN organization funds, uh, probably somewhere on one of your social media sites, there's probably a valid, um, contribution site to help those folks in the Philippines because I can tell you based on the new footage that's finally started to come in right. I'm seeing some serious devastation uh, I could tell from that uh, Takaban city footage that we were seeing right. that that city is totally wiped out but now we're beginning to get stuff from other areas and well, that storm truly devastated the Philippines so they can use all the help they can get uh, segueing from the international scene to the national scene, um, what else was big in the news is going to still be big in the news. I suspect that NFL bullying slash racial invective slash locker room, what do we want to call that? L locker room. Hard to categorize that. <laughs> Bruha, yeah. Bruhaha? It's it not just Bruhaha. It's, 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 I guess locker room culture is how right. a lot of the a lot of, of the yes. <laughs> a lot yeah. of the, the the other media outlets that we're trying to investigate this particular story we're calling it. Right. Uh, but the uh, Richie Incognito and Jeremy Marin story in the Miami Dolphins locker room, where all kinds of strange racially charged invectives were being bandied back and forth, or in one instance, it was being bandied back and forth, and the other one is just going just one in way. one direction. <laughs> so um, we have not heard from Mr. Marin himself, Mr. Incognito. Uh, why don't you give us the background of the story? I'm kind of talking around. Well, it. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, apparently, uh, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's, uh, I think it's Jonathan Marin. Uh, is the player's name, and uh, and I b I believe he's out of football for the moment. He stepped back off the team. Yeah, he just resigned from the team as a right. result of this. And and right, and his and uh, he basically left the team after apparently not being able to deal with the culture in the locker room where he was uh, bullied and insulted and demeaned and going way beyond say hazing, which by itself isn't a. Uh, allowed in the NFL anyway. But this was coming from one source. This was coming f mainly from one source. There's a little bit of other stuff mm -hmm. going on. Uh, but mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Incognito was definitely the leader of the insult barrage and the, uh, the frequent use of the N-word and other demeaning terms targeted at this one player, basically just to, 
uh, Mr. Incognito alleges that, oh, that was just part of the locker room locker culture. Room culture right. And that's just how we did things. But uh, now it's, well, it's blown come up. to light. It's blown up into a serious, serious, beyond the locker room right. <laughs> and into, dynamic. And into a general discussion of bullying. Uh, and into sports culture and sports locker room culture right. and what. And, and it's popped up on all over uh, the, the Twitter sphere and the, right. <laughs> the blogosphere and the whatever. And even on the typical usual NFL broadcast, uh, who was it? Shannon Sharp, who Shannon does, Sharp. does color commentary and, and analysis for one of those NFL shows, basically went off on last Sunday, previous Sunday, not yesterday Sunday, by the time this is this year, right, right, right. And, and was incensed at the kinds of racial epithets and use of the N-word that Incognito was uh, hurling and tweeting and leaving phone messages and whatever right. on Marin's, at Marin's way. Uh, and it got into a whole thing about what kind of locker room demeanor, what kind of racial dynamic was in that Miami Dolphin locker room because as far as Sharp was concerned, the fact that so many, uh, so much free usage of that N-word so liberally by one white lineman who plays next to a one black lineman was allowed to even exist in that locker room and that other black players were not up in arms about it. That's he totally went off. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, so. I, I just watched the video just mm -hmm. before this, uh, this airing and uh, he just Call the players to task in, in a locker room that's 75 to 80 percent black. That this was a, a, a allowed to go on, right? Uh, out yeah. in the open, not just hidden. Not that's just right. it was. Every, it was a uh, well known. Sh sharp, sharp was incensed, and right. evidently a whole lot of other people were. It was interesting. I also was scanning the 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 the, the, the Sunday shows and uh, on MSNBC. Melissa Harris Perry had a big panel roundtable discussion. And she had a uh, female uh, NFL writer, uh, Janelle, I can't think of her last name. Um, she had a former NFL player. And they were all talking about the fact that that kind of intimidation, uh, macho posturing, uh, uh, insult f tossing culture is just part of the dynamics of professional football. and that even though they seem to feel it's part of their culture of expressing who they are as a, quote, masculine individual, as a, quote, man, that it's something that's pretty much gone beyond the pale. I, I, think, that's the, I think that's the issue here. Uh, yeah, you're going to have trash talking, of course, and uh, especially down the, on the line during the game. Of course, they're going to insult each other to their faces as they're ready to block them. That's yeah, yeah, normal part of... Yeah, but this is your teammate. This is right. Right, I understand. <laughs> I understand, but I'm just saying that the culture of uh, <laughs> challenging even your yeah. teammate is uh, nothing new, but yeah. this constant, the phone calls, the tweets, the, 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 the emails, the constant harassing and on and on. Insulting. Right. Uh, seriously, so I, mean, now we're I believe there was even one, one line level. where he was saying something about this man's mother. Right. And I, well, I said, about his mother? Right. I mean, that's beyond the pale. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not a 350-pound lineman, but I got to right. tell you, somebody saying something about my mother, I, I, might, I might be losing you it. You might say something. <laughs> I, I would, might, too. I, I would don't too. know about saying something. I might be totally might losing it. <laughs> I might lose the fight, but I'm going to have something to <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, so I don't I know. know. What you mean. But anyway, this, uh, so you know, folks, you, you probably, we do have these lower thirds, thank goodness. That, Media Watch, I'm Eric Tate. I'm and Bob Anthony. <laughs> and um, we're just trying to track down stories that have been percolating and will probably still be percolating. And they deal with issues that are germane to basically all of us as human beings. Um, uh, and, 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 and because it's a, a journalism, journalistic work or report card, there was and still probably will be vestiges of this story where 60 minutes fell into the trap of, uh, I call it the far right fixation. I like those alliterative phrases, the far sure. right fixation on quote Benghazi cover up. And I say quote Benghazi cover up 
because there's been a big Republican push to try to make something out of what thin air about what tragically transpired in Benghazi right. uh, at the back end of Hillary Clinton's term as Secretary of State when Tripoli it was basically overrun. Right. Uh, and and the, the cover up, cover up and hearings about the cover up, cover up never came to anything. Nothing untoward was really done that should not have been done or vice versa. But it just won't rest. So some informant uh, came forward with a new iteration of what happened that particular day at the embassy compound. Right. Uh, and because he seemed to have been present, a told 60 Minutes he was present and he saw what had transpired and he seemed to have a new spin on the story, they basically, you know, listened to him and decided to put that story on the air. Uh, and I believe Bob check me if I'm wrong, it was Media Matters, one of those online sources that claimed that they'd tried to tell 60 Minutes or just blow the whistle that this guy Couldn't doesn't know what he's talking about right. because it, he, he wasn't uh, there and right. he told the FBI right. he I'm wasn't not, there. I'm not sure if it was them, but <laughs> yeah, it and was then, out. Uh, and then I believe the Washington Post also right. came out with the fact that this does not jive. This is not what this guy told <laughs> Right. the FBI when they did the debriefing of the and people that's, there. That's what caught him right there. And so that, that but, but even though these things were being noised about before the broadcast, right. Lara Logan and her producer decided they were going to put that story on the air anyway. And lo and behold, this gentleman, Dylan Davies, I believe he had one name when he was talking to them and it turned out he had another name. I'm not sure which name is the pseudonym and which name is it's, the it's one. real one. But, but he came on one as Dylan Davies, real or phony. <laughs> turns out that, yeah, he had told the FBI something totally different than he told 60 Minutes. So right. And, and based on what he told the FBI, he could not have he been in that location been, right. and seen what he That's said right. he saw. Now, the Flat interesting out. thing about the, this that makes it more murky for CBS, it turns out that this guy was about to publish a book through the Simon & Schuster publishing imprint, which turns out to be owned by the same corporate entity that owns mm -hmm. CBS. Oh. So now we have the confluence of a book about to come out, a story that the right-wing media machine never wants <laughs> to die, and here's 60 Minutes letting themselves get caught up in this crazy whatever. And it exploded in their faces. Right. Uh, the guy was proven to not have been there. He did not put a rifle butt to one of the assaulters' face, as he said, and the guy didn't crumple, but mm -hmm. whatever dramatic tale he told. Uh, turned out to be bogus. Uh, and yeah. so 60 Minutes had to, last week, come out with a, I'm sorry, mea culpa, we apologize, we, we were misled, I believe, was right. what Miss Logan had and, to say. And retraction is a word that CBS, uh, 60 Minutes, never ever wants to use. Hey, uh, they, you know. they basically had to eat the whole thing. Yeah, basically, we're sorry. But it's not as if... CBS doesn't have FBI sources. They do. Right. It's not as if when things surface before the broadcast that maybe you don't quite have this right, they couldn't have called their FBI sources. There was some play about the fact that they challenged him and he said, well, he told a cover story because that's what they wanted him to say. And the, I mean, you know, the lie within the lie. And they sure. went, oh, OK, that sounds plausible. <laughs> well, it wasn't. But so they got caught up in, in that. Um, but I have to really uh, 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 take 60 minutes to task because they have uh, a team of uh, journalists and fact checkers and copy editors and whatnot that really vet everything. It's one of the few pieces of CBS they haven't sliced the entire budget out of. They actually do have people yeah. who can vet these stories and like you said, they have the sources, yet this still went through as as was. Yeah, there there have been a number of media 
and other outlets that examine the story. I know the, the folks at uh, PBS Channel 13, they brought on some media sure. experts to say, can you explain to us what, uh, as a former producer at CBS or a former media, what might have gone wrong and what happened to the vetting process? Right. <laughs> and, and, and their conclusion was that, you know, the apology didn't come close to explaining to the viewers how that could have happened. And right. so if you're going to apologize, the, 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 the call was for it. We could have used a little bit more transparency had CBS really wanted to make amends and explain to the viewing public how in the world could that actually have happened. Not just, we got misled, we're sorry. I agree. Yeah, let's go back into, yeah, but don't you have people, as Bob just said, who check this stuff and triple check and double check, especially on a hot button story like this Benghazi story. And they, that's the one where you not only triple check, you quadruple check right. that kind of story. Right. So, I, you know, one guy was giving CBS credit for publicly apologizing on the air, which he says not very many media people do. And yeah, he's probably right about that. I'll, I'll agree with that. <laughs> okay, but, okay. But, but. but Nature of the Beast is, you got to double check and triple check, uh, right. especially on stories that you know somebody might have an agenda to push. Right. And so. Sometimes in the race <laughs> for those ratings, uh, that last vetting process just doesn't get there. And yeah. I hope that wasn't the case here. But well, the bottom line, what I read the other day was Simon & Schuster decided they're not publishing the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe the public has been spared. I think that. <laughs> another, uh, another bad book after all this. Well, maybe so there maybe was some good silver lining. <laughs> yes, I, I'll so, agree with that. <laughs> so, uh, we don't have much time left, but there's one story we must touch on. Yeah, that's, we, have, we have about we, six minutes. We call, we call it New York City, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and the New York Police Department, that's the quote, New York City, versus Judge Shira Shineland. <laughs> and of course, folks, you know, this is the stop and frisk story that Media Watch always tries to keep you up to date on. Right. And it turns out that the city's appeal against the judge's ruling, Judge Shineland, was actually approved by the three-judge appellate panel. Uh, and they, they went so far as to claim that Judge Shineland had misled the judicial process by getting the case steered to her court and so that was a breach in judicial policy, et cetera, things like that. And basically, they agreed with the city. Uh, and so they put on hold the judge's ruling that there should be a monitor and the city of New York needs to be doing no more stop and frisk practices as they have been as doing they in, have the been past. in the past. has Correct. to be modified. It has to be in such a way that it's not violating people's constitutional rights. Right. So now, that ruling has been stayed. Uh, but Bob, what's your take on what the city has since done in, in addition to that ruling being stayed? Well, now the Corporation Council, now the city of New York wants to basically wash away just uh, uh, as if the the original uh, ruling had never been made. They just wanted to vacate her entire ruling uh, that there had to be a monitor, that uh, these rights couldn't be abrogated. Oh, yes, because what if they do that, then it, it's as if they had never been ruled to be right. con unconstitutional. The practice had Correct. never been ruled. Correct. And so it seems that there's a quote stain on the NYPD's reputation that the Corporation Council is trying to remove. Right, and, uh, and, and you and I would agree that not just the NYPD a stain, uh, also the Bloomberg administration oh, in, in, in general. It's really the Bloomberg administration does yes. not want to stain on, on, on what they used to refer to as King Bloomberg, let's <laughs> say they, actually I used to refer to him, anybody who would abrogate the people's will and single-handedly abolished term limits that the people voted in. Right. I call that King Bloomberg. Okay. So I, I, that, that's personal opinion, folks. That's not objective. But, you know, facts speak for themselves. But in any event, he's trying to whitewash this ruling. Right. Now, it turns out that the incoming mayor doesn't plan 
to keep that appeal in place. He right. said he has, does not plan. Bill to do de Blasio that appeal. has said That's out right. front that he would. He, he would. He's going to withdraw that appeal. Right. And so this is the reasoning behind this new move by the corporate counsel to vacate that judge's ruling, right. because if Bill de Blasio pulls that appeal, then guess what? Even though they're stated, when it comes back in. If it's another judge and another judge rules that, oh yeah, that can move forward, but right. guess what? It they're will, gonna, they're it gonna, will move <laughs> forward. That's right. So, so that's going to be really interesting to stay on top of because guess what? Judge Shineland has an attorney who has filed papers in her defense. Correct. And he claims that this is, I forget, what was his quote? Something like uh, uh, he, he judicial McCarthyism. McCarthyism. That right. was the quote. He said he never thought that the Corporation Council would stoop so low as to try to malign a judge's reputation. And he actually called, used that term, judicial McCarthyism. For you young people out there, uh, Joe McCarthy was one of those red-baiting communist witch-hunting folks back in the 50s who would call people all kinds of nefarious names and Trump and use all kinds of trumped-up charges. <laughs> and so when you hear the term McCarthyism, that's what they're referring to. Right. And trust me, they were trumped up charges. Yes. <laughs> he used to do a thing like, there are 99 communists at the United Nations. <laughs> and where'd, go, where'd you get that number from? Right. It would come out of the <laughs> air. The, out, of, out of the ethers, you said. But yet, if you disagreed with them, that number <laughs> would move to 100. 150. <laughs> right. So, and you'd so, be one of them. Right. So Judge Shannon is not taking this assault on her judicial integrity right. uh, lying down or meekly right, right. she is so, pushing back so, so it's going to be very interesting to see one what her legal challenge to their right. stuff turns out to be and two since the incoming mayor has bluntly stated that hey had the bloomberg administration listened to all kinds of people in the community this would have never happened there would have been no ruling by any judge right and the communities would have been a lot happier uh, and so, therefore, that's why he plans to withdraw that appeal. Correct. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that all transpires. So we're about so, at a uh, minute left. Well, you know, the, we could close out with that one little take from Richard Prince's journalism uh, blurb. Uh, his blog, his online um, yeah, blog you can called Journalism. Our, our good friend, former New York Association of Black Journalists president, Yannick Reislam. Yes. Yannick and uh, another one of her uh, health reporters, editors, can't remember the young lady's name, uh, will be c launching and collaborating on a new web-based right. I'm sure if you, site Google, production. If, you if you Google her name, Yannick Rice Lamb, it should come up. I think it's called fierceforwomen.com. It's okay. going to be the new, the new entity. Wait a minute, I got it right here. Let me, let me, let me As not we give you. <laughs> we have about 10 seconds. Yes. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. Fearsforwomen.com. And this has been NYBJ Media Watch. I'm Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. And we'll catch you the next time.